Welcome to Thought in Motion, a series dedicated to the seminars of psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Today's video is on Lecture 22 in Seminar 1 entitled The Concept of Analysis. I'll address the following questions. 1. Why is ignorance rather than love and hate the most important passion? 2. How is transference established? And 3. What is the schema and concept of analysis? If you enjoy this video, please consider liking it, sharing it, and subscribing to my channel. Let's begin with the first question. Why is ignorance rather than love and hate the most important passion? Lacan begins this final lecture taking questions from the audience. One of those in attendance asked him to address the passions located at the junctures of the symbolic, imaginary, and real. In the previous lecture, we were introduced to three passions of love, hate, and ignorance. Love functions at the junction of the symbolic and imaginary, whereas hate operates at the junction of the imaginary and real. Finally, there is ignorance, which resides at the junction of the real and symbolic, and which Lacan states in that lecture is the often ignored passion. Yet, it's an essential one for psychoanalysis as the subject's position of ignorance is a fundamental reference point for it. In this lecture, he'll elaborate on these three passions. Beginning with love, Lacan distinguishes two kinds. One, love as an imaginary passion, and two, love as an active gift constituted on the symbolic plane. As an imaginary passion, love is fundamentally narcissistic. It attempts to capture and turn the other into an object that is absorbed into oneself. This love is a desire to be loved, and it desires this object be enslaved to what Lacan calls the absolute particularity of oneself. He adds that we're not satisfied by being loved for our general qualities and characteristics. Instead, we demand to be loved for everything, not only for our ego, but also, as Lacan puts it, for the color of one's hair, idiosyncrasies, weaknesses, everything. Then there is love as the active gift. This love, in contrast, is directed at the other and toward their being an unthinkable particularity. Speech is necessary to mediate this kind of love, and without it, one would be left only with imaginary fascination. Lacan will say much more about this love in later lectures, especially Seminar 8. Next, there's hate. If in love, the other becomes the object of narcissistic investment in saturating our image of ourselves, hate transpires when the other frustrates us and falls short of that image. This consequently engenders a maximum destructive tension. In hate, one wishes the other's debasement, disturbance, and ruin. Lacan then moves to consider hate as a cultural phenomenon, identifying Western civilization as one of hatred and marked by the race to its own destruction. This analysis has some resonances with Heidegger's own critique in which he saw Western civilization undergoing a cultural and intellectual crisis and decline leading to nihilism. This is highlighted by the role of technology in contemporary society and how humanity and nature are being objectivized for the sake of technological progress. Lacan seems to take up this objectivization in civilization and links it to what within the structure of the ego is the pole of hatred. He adds there is a certain banality to this hatred as it's clothed in our everyday discourse under many guises. It meets with such extraordinary, easy rationalizations. This made me think of the concept of the banality of evil developed by Hannah Arendt. Although she doesn't publish that work, Eichmann in Jerusalem, for another 10 years, I believe. Finally, we encounter ignorance, which is situated between the symbolic and real. With this passion, we're given some insight into the position of the analyst who is likened to Socrates. In the dialogue named uh, the Mino, Socrates seeks to arrive at a definition of virtue with his interlocutor, Mino. But Mino responds that it's impossible to look for what one does not already know. Because if you found that knowledge, how would you know you found it unless you already knew it, that you already had possession of that knowledge? 
And so Socrates demonstrates how it is possible to move from a state of ignorance to knowledge by having one of Mino's slaves come up with the solution to a problem of geometry through a series of questions. In doing so, according to Lacan, Socrates teaches the slave to give his own speech its true meaning. Though there's much to uh, address here in regards to the text, especially concerning Socrates' idea of anamnesis, what's important in this context seems to be how one begins in a place of ignorance. But rather than something negative, it's the very condition of possibility for bringing the repressed thing into existence. Whether in Plato it's the forgotten forms, or in Lacan the repressed desire. The implication for psychoanalysis is that the analysts must not be the ones who think they know something. In fact, this is the error of much of psychology for Lacan. He has a very interesting line in which he says, In psychology, nobody knows much except that psychology is itself an error of perspective of the human being. Now let's address question two. How is transference established? At the beginning of this lecture, a second question was raised about transference and the confusion around it being defined in terms of emotion rather than ideas. This leads Lacan to make one of his most authoritative statements in the entire seminar, in which he implores his audience to radically renounce the opposition between the affective and the intellectual. This then leads him to rearticulate the core of his teaching, which concerns the meaning and function of speech. Speech is what founds intersubjectivity. It situates the two subjectivities within the dimension of being and through retroaction transforms them. Transference is the path for this transformation. Lacan presents differing interpretations of transference. One, as already mentioned, is that it concerns emotion. Transference is also thought of in relation to the real as a phenomenon that takes place in the here and now between analyst and analysan. Though proposed to be in the real, it's a real that is in fact imaginary, according to Lacan. His own approach also considers transference in light of the imaginary relation between two. But critically, it also always involves a third party. To understand this, we have to uh, return to some things that we've talked about in previous videos to consider how the imaginary takes on a specialized function within the human being. As we've mentioned before, Animals, uh, for animals, the imaginary concerns the gestalt relation between organism and object of desire. For the human, however, the imaginary is principally centered on the specular image of the ego, which causes all sorts of problems due to a gap formed between that image of ourselves and our premature state as a child. The nascent subject ceaselessly seeks to cover over this gap with a series of imaginary identifications in which one rediscovers the image of oneself over and over again. And we talked about this in terms of the seesaw of desire. This history of identifications comes to structure one's basic categories and understanding of the world, and as well as its objects. A consequence of this is that the image of oneself is always achieved through the intermediary of the other. That relation is a dialectical one that moves back and forth between love and hate. While forming this structuring image of the ego, however, there are points of imaginary fixation that remain unassimilable to speech, exemplified by trauma. These traumatic images cannot be successfully assimilated and so they're repressed, giving rise to the holes in one's history and gaps in speech. The rule of free association in psychoanalysis strips speech of its social conventions. This allows it to move more freely and opens a greater possibility for mistakes in which these repressed dimensions of the speaking subject join up with the discoursing subject in the mistake. Transference then takes place in the exchange of signifiers between analysis and analyst which transpires through gradual revelations in speech of imaginary relations spoken to the analysts, who at times will also speak in the form of an interpretation. It's this relation to the other that transference through the exchange of signifiers is made manifest. The aim of psychoanalysis then is for the subject to become committed to bringing that truncated imaginary that's currently repressed 
into being. Let's take up our final question for today. What is the schema and concept of analysis? With what we've covered so far, we can now understand the schema of analysis presented diagrammatically by Lacan in this lecture. Here we find O, representing the unconscious ego of the subject, who is represented by the letter A. O is what the subject A fails to recognize of itself as an ego, which are those unassimilable traumas of one's history. The aim of analysis is to integrate these elements into the symbolic, which occurs through speech and the mediation of the other, who in psychoanalysis is the analyst. In doing so, what was located with O is passed over to O prime, which I believe is the image of the analyst, the analyst ego, though it's not made explicit as far as I could tell in the text. At the same time, subject A makes itself heard in subject B, which is the subject of the analyst. The letter C here represents the subject insofar as it's distinguished from O, the unconscious ego. And we can see here how line C spirals closer and closer to O, as well as reducing the distance between A and O, between the subject and their own unconscious ego. The spiral represents the revolving dialogue and the transference of the analytic relation. And there is a kind of echo of this discourse in analysis as we move from the revealing speech of the an analysand to the interpretation of that speech by the analyst. Progress is gradually made in first acknowledging one's history in the first person, of assuming what is me, moi, the ego, into the je, the I, the subject. For Lacan, this is the true meaning of Freud's line, where it was, their ego shall be except we might say now that the ego will be taken back up by the subject rather than the inverse as it's typically understood. But this acknowledgement is only the first step. The next is to make progress in terms of the symbolic relations, including the halts and inhibitions of the symbolic superego that facilitates repression in the first place. Lacan specifies that all of this takes time. The echoing of discourse between analysand and analyst must not come together too quickly as it would make the transference too intense and thereby evoke resistance, which Lacan says manifests as an unproductive silence. He mentions in a brief aside that there is a generative silence that recognizes the presence of the other, but doesn't say much more about that. So something to keep in mind as we continue on in these seminars. So we conclude this seminar with an answer to the question, what is the concept of analysis? Remember in a previous video that the concept is the time of the thing. For Lacan, transference is the concept of analysis. And consequently, it is also the time of analysis. Psychoanalysis takes time. It's not going to be completed in 15 sessions that you, the insurance company covers. And with that, we'll end today. And we'll also be ending seminar one. Uh, before diving into seminar two, however, I will be making one last video about this seminar in which I'll address the following questions. In reading this seminar, what surprised me? And the second question I'll, uh, I'll address are what are my top 10 ideas that I'm taking away from this reading of the seminar? As always, thank you for watching. Until next time, be well.